this presentation looks at structural development, big changes that are occurring in the nickel industry, um, and just pulls together some of the, the research that we've been doing in this space um, over the last three, four years. Um, see if we can move along here. So CRU is an analysis consulting event business, been established since 1969. There's about 250 of us. Um, about 50 of us in consulting, about 100 analysts, um, five of which cover stainless steel, nickel, battery metals um, on a full-time basis. Um, this presentation outlines um, a few themes and looks at the impact on the nickel value chain, um, both on the metallurgical side and also on the chemical side feeding into electric vehicles, um, battery chemicals. Uh, finish off with a, a bit about nickel prices and uh, points to watch. Um, so this is a map of Indonesia or part of Indonesia. Um, and there's quite a lot going on there. Um, I'd perhaps call it ground zero in the race to secure raw materials. Um, so the aqua blue um, labels are operating mines and MPI. And then the purple green um, are new MPI, nickel pig iron, um, uh, stainless steel, industrial parks, ferro nickel, um, and HPAL, which is high pressure acid leach. Um, so there's a lot of developments happening um, with Indonesia, a lot of it with Chinese capital. Um, there's been various mining bans uh, over the last 10 years, which have been enforced and relaxed. Um, but it seems over the last couple of years, um, the investments from China um, have been substantial. I was in Sulawesi uh, about a month ago and seen a, a large industrial park called Murawali, um, which has been built within a year. It's about a $10 million investment. Um, it is a small city, about 30,000 people working there. It has roads, it has a large port, it has um, many RKF MPI lines, the largest stainless steel plant in the world. Um, it, it's very impressive and I can't think of anything um, in, in certainly from Western capital that's, that's comparable in terms of the speed and the scope of, um, of what's been built there. Um, these are a a four themes that I draw your attention to. I guess the first one um, is electric vehicles here affecting the nickel and battery chemical industry. Second one is environmental policy, in particular China. So air pollution in China is a big issue for the CCP. Uh, geopolitics, uh, more nationalistic politics um, and the impact of those two things on the traditional model of China importing raw materials and then processing them um, domestically is changing. So um, China seems to be more um, agreeable to the idea of um, processing minerals overseas, such as um, the, the developments in Indonesia that I just mentioned. Um, there's changes in the value chain, of the economics of the value chain as well. So mining nickel um, and then converting it into nickel pig iron um, at the source um, has savings in terms of logistics. And then hot charging MPI into stainless means you have, um, in the case of Qingshan Murawali, the, the lowest cost stainless steel plant in the world, um, according to CRU analysts. So this idea of an industrial cluster is nothing new, and we've seen it in the aluminium industry, we've seen it in steel industry, um, integrating upstream all the way down to downstream, looking at the benefits, spin-offs, auxiliary industries, up downward linkages. For those of you that aren't particularly familiar with the nickel value chain, um, I, I've tried, I've spent the last six months trying to get my head around it. Um, it, it's really complicated and um, 
a range of technical and economic factors drive the use of different technology and which products you produce. Um, the expectations around EVs and batteries, your catalysts for your change in your nickel value chain. So two strategies for getting more nickel sulfate, which is um, this, I don't know if there's a pointer here, but yeah, nickel sulfate here, which has got a ring around it. Nickel sulfate is what you use um, to make batteries. So um, you, you make a battery precursor with nickel sulfate. And then that forms part of the cathode um, of a battery. Um, and electric vehicles require large um, battery packs, and that means a lot of metals. So if you if you want to get some more nickel sulfate, you can use more MPI uh, to make stainless, which frees up some of your metal, which can then go into nickel sulfate. Or your second strategy can be to build a new HPAL, which is what I indicated in that slide with all of the annotations around Indonesia. Um, and you can produce nickel cobalt intermediates, which then go into nickel sulfate, which then go into batteries. This map just shows, I, I guess, the geology of um, nickel reserves. Um, and, and the key point is really that the process um, is driven by geology and the sulfate resources or sulfide resources um, are now depleted. Laterite's main supply growth um, means rising importance of Indonesia and the Philippines, which is why we've got this big um, blue area uh, over Southeast Asia. And that, that's really um, followed a price spike um, in 2006, 2007, where the nickel price went above $40,000. Um, and that led to a rapid development of MPI in China um, based on imported ore from Indonesia, the Philippines. Um, as you can see here, the MPI phenomenon started in China. Um, so that's the... Oh. Here we go. Um, the green bars chart on the left-hand side. Um, and so, yeah, producing about four, 500,000 uh, tons of MPI on a nickel-contained basis. Um, but the future um, is really around Indonesia and uh, production of MPI in Indonesia, as you can see by the blue bars. Um, so lots of growth. Um, in the last few years and much more expected and Indonesia will become the largest MPI producer within five years. And that is all based around um, the, the need to secure those resources and the part, in part, the government's, the economics of it, but also um, the government's desire to, to push companies to go downstream. Um, these charts indicate the next five years, most growth in nickel demand will be in stainless. Um, although there will be significant demand from batteries from a very low base. So in 2018, nickel in batteries is just 4%. So if you compare that with lithium or if you compare it with cobalt, which already have more than 50% of their um, demand coming from the battery space, uh, nickel um, is a much bigger industry, and stainless is still uh, stainless steel will still be the main driver of it in the short term. Um, if you go out further, and depending on your EV forecasts, um, you have a very um, different picture where batteries become very important for for the nickel industry. Um, these charts just show some modeling that was done by crew. Um, and this is around the penetration of electric vehicles. So the big blue um, area on the left-hand chart is petrol engines, um, global vehicle demand. And the red bit is diesel. Um, and then this rapidly sort of expanding pink 
shaded area is battery electric vehicles. It's currently a very small part, but it's, it's growing very rapidly um, and penetration um, could be very high in 10, 20 years. Um, and th these, these vehicles require very large battery packs, much larger than the batteries that you have in your phone or in your laptop. Um, so this is based on pretty extensive modeling of macroeconomic policy costs. And what's quite interesting now is that even without uh, subsidies, electric vehicles are, are cheaper than um, internal combustion engine vehicles on a total cost of ownership basis. Um, add to that lithium ion NMC um, chemistry uh, batteries are likely to emerge or, or they have emerged as the preferred battery chemistry and the preferences for high nickel. And this will have a big impact on nickel sulfate, which is just 100,000 tons today, uh, but might be 1.3 million tons in 2030. Um, and currently HPAL, high pressure acid leach, producing from MH, producing MHP, MSP, it's one of the cheapest ways to get to nickel sulfate, which is your battery precursor, which produces your batteries. So there's scope for huge volumes. These are some of the flows of MHP, MSP at the moment. Limited buyers and sellers, a lot of the capacity is vertically integrated, but this market could change quite dramatically within um, the next few years. Um, H Power has a, a checkered history. Um, uh, technical risk is high. Um, historically, capex overruns, performance issues, equipment failures. Um, but you may be aware that in Indonesia there are currently four H Powers, new H Powers being built. Um, capex announced around a billion dollars. They're all built with Chinese capital, um, and they're all built within these industrial clusters um, or mostly built within these industrial clusters what, what, which I was mentioning before and with linkages into the battery chemical sector. So big Chinese battery firms getting into the resource industry in Southeast Asia. Um, it's question marks over, over whether the equipment will be sufficient quality. It's all manufactured in China. Um, and the, there's also question marks around the environment tailings, but they're going ahead very rapidly. And so I'd expect some successes and some failures. Um, final slide here, um, just a couple of um, ideas around the nickel price. So the left-hand side chart breaks out the nickel price into cycles, into short-term cycles, investment cycles, um, a longer-term trend. Um, we did a lot of work around this yeah, across different commodities and there's some, some fairly interesting implications that um, I can discuss separately with anyone who's interested. Um, I think the application for nickel prices or your comparison for nickel prices is that they're, they're very different or, or they're much more extreme than perhaps even um, uh, our other metals prices such as copper or iron ore or coal or aluminium or um, anything um, that you might come across. Um, the commodity prices are volatile. Um, nickel prices seem to be particularly volatile and maybe there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that and a few reasons why that may be true going forward and um, part of it is the technology risk um, so when you're looking at price expectations you tend to have a, a think about costs um, uh, and in nickel if you look at a long-term price forecast you, you could have two very good analysts and one could come out with something that was around the price today, $13,000, and another one could come up with $25,000 and they would be equally as valid. And it really just depends where um, your marginal player might be. So if your marginal player is metal, nickel metal, um, then it would be 
uh, up in the $20,000, per ton mark. Um, if, if you can fulfill demand through MPI and make HPOW work, then prices that we have today could could be sufficient or, or maybe just a bit more up at sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars um so it's a very difficult industry to to plan for because of that price volatility um the the added issue going forward as well as the outlook for electric vehicles our base case is that batteries will be a third of nickel demand by 2030 um and that there's where we feel that those um forecasts are conservative but electric vehicles are still in the very early stages um, so your margin for error in forecasting on EV penetration is very high. Um, so uh, some of the things that we, we do with our clients is planning, um, scenario planning, Monte Carlo, real options, develop flexible strategies um, for, um, for, for looking forward um, that deal with a range of future states of the world. Um, so I think to sum up, I, I'd probably just highlight that in the nickel value chain, both chemical and metallurgical, so um, battery chemicals and stainless steel, there's, there's some big developments happening right here in Southeast Asia. Um, and, th and that's being driven by some big macroeconomic themes as well as um, changes the economics of the value chain themselves. Um, second summary point, I guess, would be that I know the next three to five years, stainless steel is still very important to the outlook for nickel. Um, but, but beyond that time horizon, um, electric vehicles and batteries will really drive um, the story around nickel, or at least we expect, um, we expect that will be the case. Um, the third summary point is really around that last slide on um, price volatility and nickel being uh, at the very extreme end of um, a volatile commodity, which makes it both interesting and difficult to handle and, um, and uh, understand. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for listening, everyone. Uh, for Ian, while you're thinking... Ian, I want to just ask you a little bit about um, the. You mentioned the Hua, uh, Hua Yu uh, HPAL project in Indonesia. There have been some questions asked about whether they can actually uh, deliver on their promises at, at, at the cost that they're saying and the, and the volumes and the purity uh, of the nickel sulfate they're going to produce. What are your, what are your thoughts on, on the viability of the project and, and how likely it is to succeed? I don't really have a, a comment specifically on uh, Huayo, but um, I, I think across, the, there's probably four credible um, H power projects in Indonesia. Um, and the, there are some serious questions um, given the history of H power about whether um, they can be brought online um, at the costs that um, are announced. So all of them are around the billion dollar. Um, mark um, and if you look at the history uh, one of the charts up there just shows um, that often capex blowouts have been four or five billion US dollars for, for H power projects um, I think there is um, some of the technical guys I've spoken with through various projects so we've been involved in some of the financing um, around some of these um, new, new H powers. And um, some of them are, are pretty confident that they've solved some of the technical issues. So the technical issues relate to um, certain specialized parts of um, uh, H power units, such as autoclaves and pumps. Um, and the things that impact on that as well is the ore preparation. So um, it's important that you have a consistent feed going into an H pal um, because it will be set up specifically for a certain chemistry um, to, to go in. 
Um, so there seems to be a few success factors and it seems like the technical guys involved in these projects um, know, know about what went wrong with the, the previous projects or, or which all came around in sort of um, early, mid 2000s um, and think they've got a handle on how to solve those. And, and the second aspect is is the equipment. So um, China has um, really moved along the value chain and they will be producing the equipment, um, these specialist parts. Um, and I think it's reasonable to assume that um, they've probably got to the, the quality standards now that are necessary. Um, but yeah, uh, I think seeing it in action will be uh will, will be will be good mm. and nickel sulfate that goes into batteries it needs to be very high purity doesn't it if there's any yeah yeah that, i'm not a technical guy but yeah that's that's my understanding so um it, it either comes from nickel metal or or it can be processed directly from nickel cobalt intermediates which come out of um h pal um, facilities but i i as, as far as i understand it impurities in nickel sulfate in batteries would is a fire risk uh is that yeah m maybe <laughs> as, as far as i as far as i understand it um so do we have any any further questions uh from the audience about the nickel market that was a very comprehensive uh, briefing there uh, so can i have a big uh, round of applause for ian hiscock please <laughs> <laughs>